fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. Listen, if you're looking for life on easy street with no conflict or challenge, go home to mommy. The Christian life is not for wimps. The Christian life is not for lightweights. It's not for cowards. It's not for people who are afraid to stand out from the crowd. And so maybe some of you are saying, well, I can't handle this. Well, maybe you can. I don't know what to say to you. I'll say whatever you give up to follow Christ is more than worth it. I don't know what you see when you look in the mirror, but let me tell you what God sees when He looks at you. Because God sees you maybe differently than you see yourself. For instance, you probably see weakness when you look at yourself. God sees potential. You see what you are. God sees what you can be. You see your past. God sees your future. You see a lump of clay. God sees a beautiful sculpture. You see a blank canvas, God sees a, a Van Gogh. You see a lump of coal, God sees a perfectly cut diamond. You see a vacillating, unsure Simon, God sees a rock-like Apostle Peter. We see a Saul of Tarsus hunting young Christians and murdering them, God sees a mighty Apostle Paul preaching the gospel. I bring that up because now we're going to look at Gideon, who is a world changer. And when the Lord came to him, the greeting was, Hey, you mighty men of faith, the Lord is with you. And if there's anything Gideon was not in that moment, it was a mighty man of faith. But that's because God saw what he would become, not what he was. You know, frankly, I'm a little surprised Gideon made it into the hall of faith because he had well, a challenging beginning and not the greatest end. But what I find fascinating about Hebrews 11, which tells us about the great men and women who stepped out in faith that I call world changers, is that God never mentions their sins. He mentions their accomplishments. He talks about what they did through their faith, but he never brings up their shortcomings or sins. I find that fascinating. And God goes out of his way to take ordinary people to do extraordinary things through. Why? Because when it happens, God gets the glory. They dare not take it for themselves because they know themselves better than anybody else does. And God used Gideon to change his world. And by the way, his world was messed up big time. Uh, things are really spiritually and morally upside down in the book of Judges. In fact, whenever things are spiritually out of whack, they'll be morally out of whack and they'll be culturally out of whack as well. So here's a good verse to describe how things got the way that they were. Uh, Judges 17, 6 says that Israel had no king and everyone did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Everyone did what seemed right in their own eyes. Let me update that. Everyone just kind of did their own thing. Everyone sort of had their own truth. Not unlike today, frankly. Where someone will say, well, you know, that's your truth. That's not my truth. And I live by my own truth and my own values and my own rules because my God that I believe in would never have me do this and so on. They just sort of make it up as they go. So things were chaotic. It was a little bit like the Wild West. So the Lord raised up 13 judges to rule over Israel. 12 of them were men. One of them was a woman. Now when you think of a judge, I don't want you to think of like Supreme Court judges running around in long black robes. Actually, these were more like warriors. They were like old-time sheriffs. Think Dodge City and think Wyatt Earp. You know, when there was no law in town, so they would call in the marshal or call in a, or hire uh, a lawman to get things under control. So God would raise these judges up uh, to sort of tame the unruly behavior of Israel. And we're looking at Gideon. As our story begins, we find Gideon trying to prepare the little wheat he had, hiding behind the walls of a small wine press. 
Hardly a picture of heroism and courage, but he was like the rest of Israel, hungry, hurting, and humiliated. But God's gonna turn him into a world changer. So we're introduced to him in Judges 6, starting in verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, by the way. And the angel of the Lord appeared and said to him, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Gideon said, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, and why has all of this happened to us? Where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Stop there. Now it's interesting. Here comes the Lord calling on Gideon. And he starts in with the complaints. Well, why has this happened to us? You know, we, we remember hearing about all these miracles you used to do. Where have you been lately? <laughs> Heard the story of a mother that was telling Bible stories to her little daughter. You know, the stories of Joshua and Daniel in the lion's den and those great stories of heroism. And the little girl turned to her mom and said, Mommy, you know, God was more exciting back then. Maybe you felt that way. You hear about what God used to do. What's God doing now? And really, if you get technical, everything that Israel was facing was their own fault. They were reaping what they sowed. And the Lord could have dealt with that, but he needed to get something done. It's sort of like when you're trying to get your kids out of the house. Come on, kids, get in the car. We have to go to church. And, oh, Mommy, I, I lost a shoe. And, and, you know, Mommy, I lost my doll. And sadly, that's your husband. But, you know... <laughs> Just get in the car. We'll sort it out in the car. Come on, we're late. Let's go. And you know, but they're whining and complete. Just come on, let's go. So that's Gideon. He's kind of whining. Well, why would it be? Could just come on, let's go. We got a job to do. And you're the guy I'm going to use to do it. So now the Lord is going to use Gideon to change things in a dramatic way. But Gideon protests and he says in verse 15, Oh Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. Lord, are you serious? I'm like the runt of the litter. I'm the lowest of the low. And that brings me to principle number one on how to be a world changer. World changers are humble. God uses people who are humble. You say, well, how do you know if you're humble? Well, I find that the people talk the most, who talk the most about humility are often prideful. They'll come and say, you know, I'm a very humble person. I'm so humble. I'm so humble I drop the H and just say humble. <laughs> Hello, I'm humble. I'm an humble man, you see. No, you're kind of weird and probably prideful too. <laughs> humble people are just people that see themselves as they are. You know, they see their flaws, they see their shortcomings, they see their weaknesses. In fact, Gideon says in verse 15 to the Lord, who am I? Why would you want me, Lord? Who am I? And I love God's response. God says, who am I? I'll be with you. Who am I, Lord? It's not about who you are, it's who I am. And I'm gonna be with you, Gideon, so let's get going because you're a mighty hero, verse 12, and the Lord is with you. I mean, calling Gideon a mighty hero was almost like a joke. I mean, here he is hiding behind a wall, and the Lord says, hey, mighty hero, the Lord's with you. It's like, uh, is there somebody else here I'm not seeing? Mighty hero, who would that be? He probably felt more like a pathetic zero than a mighty hero. But as I said earlier, God saw him for what he could become, not just what he was. So he was going to grow into this title that the Lord gave to him. It'd be like going to a kid who can't throw a football and saying, hey, Tom Brady, how's it going? Or a child failing in class, hey, Einstein, how are the grades? Almost like mockery. But the Lord was not mocking him. He was seeing his potential. But before the Lord was going to allow Gideon to amass this army, there was a test he had to pass in his own home. The Lord told him to go home to his family where there was a family altar erected by his father Joash to the god Baal. God said, I want you to go and tear down the altar. Then I want you to take the second best bull from your father's herd and barbecue it on the remains of the altar. Okay, this is a way to get in trouble with dad, okay? <laughs> and incur his wrath. But in Gideon's defense, he went and did exactly what God told him to do, bringing me to principle number two. World changers are faithful in little things. 
Jesus says in Luke 16, unless you're faithful in small matters, you won't be faithful in large ones. If you cheat even a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. So Gideon tears down his dad's altar, but he did it at night. And some people have been critical, oh, I should have done it in the light of day, did it at night. Hey, yeah, okay, so what? At least he did it, got the job done. You know, there's some people that just love to criticize. They think they have the gift of criticism. By the way, there's no spiritual gift of criticism. Just be aware of that. You know, they critique this, they critique that. They'll say, well, I don't like the way you do evangelism, Greg. We don't like your events. We don't like the way you, uh, you know, speak at these events. And I'll say, well, what are you doing in evangelism? Not really anything. Well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it, okay? Now, look, I'm not saying everything we do is perfect. It isn't. But, you know, you have to be willing to take risks. You take chances. You get out there to do what you can to reach people. And I think it's very easy to be critical of these things. But my question is, what are you doing? Well, he shouldn't have gone at night. Well, he did something. He got the job done. He tore down the altar. And the people freaked out. By the way, the reason he did it at night, according to verse 27, was because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Gideon knew when he did this, he was going to anger a lot of people. In fact, they were so mad, they wanted to kill him. Let's kill him now. That's kind of harsh, but that's what they wanted to do. And guess who stood up and defended Gideon? His father. <laughs> the very father, Joash, who erected the altar to Baal, and he came out and said, hey, uh, why are you defending Baal? Why do you argue his case? If Baal's really a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. I think deep down inside, dad was proud of son. Joash was proud of Gideon. Boy, you did good. Hey, you even took down the old man's altar. Way to go. I think the faith of the father was rekindled by the courage of the son. You know, it's never too late to get back in the race of life. The Bible compares the Christian life to a race, and sometimes you might start a race and stumble and fall. Here's what you need to do. Get up again and get back in the race. If you're young, start following Jesus now. The Bible tells us, remember the Creator in the days of your youth. I was 17 years old when I became a Christian. I have never regretted that decision. I thought, oh man, think of all the fun I could have had all these years. No, no, whatever I gave up, God more than made it up to me. So follow the Lord when you're young, but when you're old, you should follow the Lord as, yet, as well. I remember that story in the book of Joshua of old Caleb, who was 80 years old. And he said to Joshua, as he was parceling out parts of the land and battles that still needed to be fought, he said, I'm as strong, I don't know if his voice sounded like that, I'm as strong today as on the day the Lord called me. It's amazing, his strength did not waver because his faith did not waver. Then he gives an insight as to why he had that passion and strength even in his older years. He said, because I have wholly followed the Lord my God, wholly followed. So in the beginning of life, at the end of life, follow Jesus. Sometimes when people are getting older, they're saying, I wanna just retire. Just order the old lazy boy. Hey, it's time to get off your big, fat, lazy boy and get to work for the kingdom of God. There are things to do. There are legacies to be passed on. There are activities for us to be engaged in as followers of Jesus in the beginning and the middle and the end of our life. Paul summed it up this way in his final epistle. He says, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the course. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day and to all who love his appearing. Paul finished his race. He fought that fight. He held his course. And that's what we need to do as well. America needs revival more than ever before. We believe it's time for another Jesus revolution. Read the unbelievable true story behind the movie as told by Pastor Greg Laurie in his timely book, Jesus Revolution, where you'll find takeaway principles to not only experience a personal spiritual revival, but find out what needs to happen to trigger another Jesus Revolution today. Receive your copy and appreciation for a gift of any size when you donate today. 
so Gideon passed his first test. Now a big one is coming. The Lord says, rally an army. So he manages to get 32,000 men to follow him in the battle. Very impressive. Now, of course, the Midianites had an army surpassing 100,000. So it's certainly not an equal army, but it's a start. And that brings us to Judges 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me if they save themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people who's ever timid or afraid they may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. Wow. I think Gideon was thinking, okay, if you're afraid, you can't handle this, go home. It's interesting, the phrase that's used there for go home is from a Hebrew phrase, mamito returnus, which translates to return to mommy. <laughs> I made all that up. Okay, it just means go home. I just want to see if you're listening sometimes. So loose paraphrase. Hey, if you want to go home to mommy, if it's too scary, go home now. 22,000 guys are like, see ya. What? 22,000. Why did he want them to leave? Why did the Lord want the fearful ones to leave? Answer, because fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. Listen, if you're looking for life on easy street with no conflict or challenge, go home to mommy. The Christian life is not for wimps. The Christian life is not for lightweights. It's not for cowards. It's not for people who are afraid to stand out from the crowd. And so maybe some of you are saying, well, I can't handle this. Or maybe you can. I don't know what to say to you. I'll say whatever you give up to follow Christ is more than worth it. But some are afraid. They're afraid of the opinions of people, afraid of this, afraid of that. Listen, I'm more afraid of hell and eternal separation from God. I'm more afraid of a pointless meaningless life live for myself. That's what scares me. But a lot of people go for those things. Well, there's one final test. So remember, he has 10,000 guys left. Judges 7, verse 4. The Lord told Gideon, you still have too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I'll sort out who will go with you and who will not. And Gideon took his warriors down to the water, and the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. The one group uh, put those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. And then the other group put those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. So here's how it worked. Lord said, let them go down and drink water. These guys are thirsty. They're dehydrated. So some of them just buried their face in the, in the river and they're just drinking. And others were very careful and they're looking around and they're very alert. And the Lord says, those are the ones I'm going to use to save you. You know, we were in Israel a number of years ago, and we went to Gideon Spring, probably the spring where this happened. So I wanted to illustrate it. So I asked for two volunteers, one to represent each group, and so they went down there drinking the water, and then I looked and I saw a sign, water contaminated, don't drink. Oh, no. Just, <laughs> someone's going to die for a sermon illustration. This is bad. Fortunately, they were okay, but it's like, wow. <laughs> well, this water was not contaminated, but apparently some of the people were. They didn't pass the test. Now he's left with 300 men. He has 3% of the original 10,000. But these now are the cream of the crop. This is Delta Force. These are the Army Rangers. These are the SEALs. These are SEAL Team 6. And you know, this is the SWAT team. These are the elite warriors now. <laughs> I love the battle plan. Okay, get the warriors together. I mean, think of these. These are the battle-hardened, toughest of the tough. All right, what do you want us to do? What swords are we going to take? What spears are we going to... Yeah, we're not going to use swords or spears. Okay, what's the plan? Okay, got a torch. See a torch right here? Okay, we're going to put a pot, a clay pot around the torch. Yeah, and beat the Midianites. No, not beat them, just hold. And then what do we have in our other hand? A big, giant spear... I got you a little trumpet. Here you go. Here's everybody's trumpet. Take your trumpet. So are these guys standing here with this stupid torch and a pot and a trumpet. Uh-huh. Now what? 
Okay, we're going to run down the mountain and we're going to yell out for the Lord and for Gideon. Then what? That's it. I love this story. It's so crazy. It's classic. It's biblical. So they do it. They obey. They come running down. It's nighttime. The Midianites are down in their camp. All of a sudden they, they hear this noise and they see fire suddenly appear. They hear these trumpets blowing. They think it's some kind of ambush and they're so disoriented and discombobulated they start killing each other. They don't know who the enemy is. The Israelites get down, they're all dead. It's like, okay, good plan. <laughs> they were outnumbered 450 to 1. Of all of the upsets celebrated by military historians or sports fans, there's none more amazing than what God accomplished through Gideon. It should be like a Pop Warner team going up against the New England Patriots and the Super Bowl and winning. This would be like a little league team taking on the Chicago Cubs in the World Series and winning. So you say, well, thank you for that nice little Bible story. Can we go home now? Well, wait, let's make an application. God doesn't just tell us these, tell us these stories to entertain us. He tells us these stories for a reason because, you see, we too are in a spiritual battle. And uh, we have to recognize that it rages around us every single day. In fact, Ephesians 6 says, we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness that rule this world, against wicked spirits in the heavenly realm. See, we're in the natural world right now, but there's a supernatural world coexisting with us at the moment. It's the world of angels and demons when there are rankings of angels and rankings of demons. And it's the world of God and Satan. And ultimately, it's the world of the afterlife of heaven and hell. It's as real as the world you're in right now. And this battle rages, and sometimes we're caught in this battle, and we're trying to fight a spiritual battle with physical weapons. So in this war we're fighting in the world today, this spiritual war, this moral war, some even call it a cultural war. Understand it's not going to be won with boycotts or protests. It's not going to be won by withdrawing, but by praying and preaching. The most effective weapons God has put in our arsenal is prayer and proclamation. Praying for people, praying for our country, praying for our culture, praying for situations we're facing, and then preaching the gospel to those that do not know the Lord. I bring this up because there's a book that's quite popular right now where the author is suggesting that we've lost this battle and uh, there's no reason to fight the flood. Just stop fighting the flood, he says, and basically says there are people alive today who may live to see the effective death of Christianity within our civilization, end quote. So he says we need to withdraw now from, no, 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 this is not the time to withdraw. This is the time to attack. <laughs> this is not the time to isolate. This is the time to infiltrate. This is the time to permeate. You say, well, you're rhyming a bunch of stuff. I have no idea what you're talking about. Can you understand what I'm saying? When I say attack, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go down to the ammo store and, you know, fill your trunk up with bullets and AR-15s or something. Well, here's what I'm saying. I have something better than an AR-15. I've got John 3.16, okay? John 3.16. And what do I mean by that? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, when I say we're fighting a battle and we need to infiltrate, I mean we need to go out with the loving message of Jesus Christ and tell people about him and how they can have their lives transformed by him. God's looking for people to do this. And the best place to start is in your own home with your own family and those closest to you. And then continue on. I love the statement of a British preacher from years ago, John Wesley, who once said, quote, give me a hundred men who love God with all of their hearts and fear nothing but sin, and I will move the world. Maybe God has spoken to your heart and you have seen 
your need for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came from heaven to this earth. He was born in a manger. He died on a cross. He rose again from the dead. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. Listen, I'm not talking about religion. I don't want to be a religious person. I don't think you want to be one either. I'm talking about relationship with God. Jesus, who died and rose again, stands at the door of your life and he knocks and he says, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. Question, have you asked Jesus Christ to come and live inside of you? You might say, well, I, I think so, I'm not sure. Hey, if someone moved into your house in the middle of the night, do you think you would be aware of it? I'm sure you would. And in the same way, if Christ has come to live inside of you, you will know. And if you don't know, Maybe he has not come in yet. He's just a prayer away. All you need to do is say, Jesus, I want this relationship with you. I want you to forgive me of my sin. I want to go to heaven when I die. Would you like to do that? Would you like Christ to come into your life? If so, why don't you just pray this simple prayer with me? You can pray it out loud or you can pray it in the quietness of your heart. But this is a prayer where you're asking Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Pray this with me now. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Now come into my life. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for hearing this prayer and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you just pray that prayer with me? If so, I want you to know in the authority of Scripture that Christ himself has come to live inside of you. And I would love to send to you, at no charge, the New Believer's Bible. It's a very friendly translation of the New Testament. You'll find very understandable. And it's filled with hundreds of notes that I wrote that will encourage you in this commitment you've just made to follow Jesus. And let me be the first to say to you, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. America needs revival more than ever before. We believe it's time for another Jesus Revolution. Read the unbelievable true story behind the movie as told by Pastor Greg Laurie in his timely book, Jesus Revolution, where you'll find takeaway principles to not only experience a personal spiritual revival, but find out what needs to happen to trigger another Jesus Revolution today. Receive your copy and appreciation for a gift of any size when you donate today. Hey, Southern California, Greg Laurie here. You know, there's nothing like gathering together in person to worship the Lord and hear the Word of God. And I want to personally invite you to live worship at our church campuses. There's two you can choose from. Our service times are 9 in the morning and 11 in the morning. So join us as we meet both inside and outside every Sunday morning.